Welcome back to Pop Dissected. When you think of the band Maroon 5, who is the first person that comes to your mind? Is it drummer Matt Flynn? Is it guitarist James Valentine? Perhaps it's keyboardist PJ Morton and Jesse Carmichael. Oh, I got it. You're thinking of Sam Farrar, bassist and percussionist. Oh, you were thinking of Adam Levine? Never heard of him. Maroon 5 is an American pop rock band known for the classic songs such as She Will Be Loved, Moves Like Jagger, Animals, and most recently, Memories. Their albums It Won't Be Soon Before Long and Five hit number one on the Billboard 200 Albums chart. Efforts such as Hands All Over, Overexposed, and Red Pill Blues followed close at number two. Maroon 5 has become one of the best-selling musical acts of all time, being recognized by Billboard on their top artist of the 2010s chart, placing at number nine. While they're a very well-recognized band with many accomplishments under their belt, their decline is pretty obvious, especially when looking into specific details about their performance. So this warrants the question, where did Maroon 5 go wrong? While we're unable to pinpoint one specific factor, we can take a look at various things that have contributed to the group's ascension, but also led to their decline. As with any time we look into this subject matter, a lot can be speculation and it may not always be entirely accurate. But that aside, I think I've been able to find some key points that correlate to their slow tumble in quality, relevance, and popularity. As we continue on, let me know where you think Maroon 5 went wrong, if you think they did it all. I'd love to hear your thoughts on the following claims. Maroon 5's debut album, Songs About Jane, was released in the summer of 2002. This album was very much a sleeper hit, eventually reaching number six on the Billboard 200 after nearly two and a half years. This album would also go on to top the UK and Australian charts around this time. Though critics didn't write home about this album, it was substantial enough to get Maroon 5's foot, or feet, in the door. Treading through funk rock with elements of pop, blue-eyed soul, and alt, the music on this album is so removed from what the band would become. I can't say if this sound is better than what we've evolved into, and though they weren't the likes of Green Day, My Chemical Romance, Nickelback, Linkin Park, or Fall Out Boy that had all either taken off or were gaining severe momentum at this time, Maroon 5 stood out sonically against all these bands. They lightly tapped into that edge and energy, but the aforementioned groups primarily found their sound in the realm of post-grunge, metal, punk rock, emo, and so on. Songs About Jane was able to play to two different strengths. It was alternative enough to get onto rock stations and had enough characteristics to allow it to be played on pop radio. This album also wasn't so pigeonholed into a genre that is catered to a specific demographic, so it allowed boys, girls, people 8 to 80 to enjoy this music. It won't be soon before long wouldn't arrive until the summer of 2007. This album is really what catapulted Maroon 5 ahead in just about every category an artist would want. Paying homage to Prince and the Talking Heads, Maroon 5 would still keep their debut's influence, but incorporate pop, electro, and disco elements. This would be where Maroon 5 had generally improved their songwriting, had more diverse subject matter that wasn't centered around one person, and was more varied in their musical approach. Make Me Wonder, their first number one single, is so different from their recent hits, it's almost shocking. There was this imprint of originality with the group that would begin to go away with Hands All Over in 2010. Now, Moves Like Jagger was only included on the re-release of this album. The initial singles, Save Misery, were their lowest peaking singles to date. At this point, critics pointed out a handful of things about Maroon 5 that have stayed true. They stated how the band had become the Adam Levine show. Their music was now formulaic and had the correct craftsmanship for the pop charts and that the songs had less in depth than what preceded it. Critics also noted how the big hits overshadowed the deeper cuts. Though it won't be soon before long offered Maroon 5 a broader mainstream appeal, Moves Like Jagger is what cemented them, a place in pop culture and pop music. Hands All Over would fall shy of a number one spot, likely because the lack of a strong lead. As aforementioned, Adam Levine became the face of the band, as their discography progresses, more outside writers are involved. 
for better or for worse, but I'd argue for worse. We will eventually lose a lot of that deep authenticity seen on the first two albums in favor of radio or trendy material. With Adam being the frontrunner, anything he does, says, or one's opinion of him really ends up affecting the entire group. If you hate Adam Levine and his voice and his character, you're really not going to gravitate towards the band of Maroon 5 since he represents it. Inherently, Adam is going to be the one to blame for anything the public does not like about Maroon 5's music or style, since he is really the known name and who is associated with the band. However, more on that in a bit. Overexposed and 5 would really cater to the masses. This was really the peak of Maroon 5's chart success. Looking at the singles alone, we can argue the band knew how to approach the pop chart topper formula. Some of these singles capture the fun Maroon 5 is known for, but I think it's inarguable they either cater to the masses or sold out for more mainstream success. Overexposed has more, albeit not a ton, of callbacks to the work preceding it. It's more closely connected. Five is so far removed and so different, it's a bit jarring, honestly. Has their sound gotten worse? That is for the individual to decide. However, by the mid-2010s, Maroon 5 has strayed so far from what their initial appeal was. Commercially, yes, it did benefit them. But by utilizing a sound that doesn't have a timeless appeal, you host a lot of issues. First, Maroon 5 alienates the audience that gravitated towards them before they imposed the sonic approach. Also, they're getting the success from a type of music that does not have any longevity in the mainstream. We could look at this as, hey, no one makes music like this anymore, so it's a neat time capsule. Or you guys just screwed yourself because this isn't the type of music people want to consume anymore. Trends change rapidly in the industry, so while you can capitalize on them, if that's your approach, you are always playing catch up and you're gonna end up being one step behind, always. This brings us to Maroon 5's most recent efforts, Red Pill Blues and Jory. These albums are overcrowded with guest features, which I can't really see why the band felt this was a necessity to their music. Their singles that did well off Red Pill Blues all had collaborations on them. I won't say these tracks aren't good, but it's interesting that having a guest feature prompted the song to earn better success as opposed to the single Wait, which did not. The album has some funk influences, but still follows in the footsteps of Five. This brings us to Jordy, which has been critically raked over the coals. Though the singles primarily offer enough distinction, the rest of the record is one uninspired mess that sounds the same through and through. As their career progressed, Maroon 5 catered to what was popular. Some say this evolution made their music bad, but I think it only really made them less desirable until recently. Outside writers and producers have given them uninspired material that wavers in this chill R&B pop vibe that isn't distinct or even remotely interesting. This is the third consecutive album in a row that has hardly had any co-writing from the other members of the band. Like I said, this outside input could be hurting the potential of the band and what we've seen from them and what we know they're capable of. This is not to say I'm against Maroon 5. I enjoy their music. It's catchy and relatively inoffensive, but the way they seemingly keep changing directions to mold to what is popular is frustrating. It can alienate listeners, come off as a shameless play into the industry, and I think has so far removed the band from what they were loved for and what helped them stand out the most when they debuted. Is their approach lazy? I can't say, but Given we know the potential of diverse genres and songwriting capability, their recent efforts almost go against that in favor of being something that they know can succeed and do well until the magic runs out. Their identifiable sound from the beginning has been smoothed out so their work can cater to the masses, and as stated earlier, that is just not sustainable. Does your music always need to be new and innovative? No. But chasing trends is very obvious to the general public. You have to give your audience credit. When you force that, every succeeding effort, I think, is going to decline in quality, since you're trying to force a sound or type of song, and I believe that's the case with Maroon 5, or Adam Levine. Speaking of, I've read that the other members of the band were apparently fine with Adam really becoming the band's face and image. As the band has been met with backlash or worsened quality, Adam Levine always becomes the topic of conversation, not the band. 
While I'm not trying to imply that the band is setting Adam up, I'm just merely exploring, that's an interesting thing to note. Adam Levine had this image of a sexy, girl-chasing white dude, which I might add is very original, that also was sweet and could be sensitive. He's talented without a doubt. However, a lot of people are not the biggest fan of his evolving ego. At times, there can be an entitled, egotistical nature about him. He played art police with Lady Gaga, which, given his tweets, I find them very ironic now. He's feuded with Christina Aguilera on The Voice and is overly defensive about any minor critique that comes his way. He stated Maroon 5 doesn't belong to any one time period, yet he doesn't know where they stand exactly. I think he's got the latter part right, but the former is very out of touch in my opinion, because Maroon 5 very much does. We can't go on without speaking about the big three controversies, all centered around Adam Levine himself. He stated a while back that rock and roll doesn't really have a place or isn't found modernly in music anymore, essentially stating hip hop is the genre in which all innovative music stems from now. You can only imagine how that went over with people. Most recently, he had an outburst during the International Song Festival in Chile, insulting the city and storming off stage. Though he later apologized, why any artist feels they can act like this, I'm not entirely sure. This then brings us to the 53rd Super Bowl halftime show in February of 2019. This performance, I really think, is a huge contributing factor into throwing Maroon 5 off their line of success. And if you don't believe me about throwing off their success, here are some various tours throughout the years, and we can see as their numbers slowly decline. Their most recent 2020 tour, missing thousands of people per show. For the Super Bowl halftime show, Maroon 5 was the third choice to perform. Rihanna and Pink both declining to show their support of Colin Kaepernick. Maroon 5 choosing to accept the offer amidst the issue likely put a bad taste in people's mouths already. Adam stated he, not the band, but he put more love and thought into the decision of accepting the offer which I don't know what that is even supposed to mean. I think after Justin Timberlake's performance, which also didn't get great reception, viewers were hoping for a dazzling show, and we would have gotten that with Rihanna or Pink. They're both great performers. Maroon 5 just isn't among the ranks of previous halftime show performers. Lady Gaga, Katy Perry, Bruno Mars, Beyonce, and Madonna all delivering excellent performances from very accomplished careers that all offered something engaging, new, and distinct in terms of their artistry or approach, what have you. There was such a precedent in the resurgence of halftime shows at the turn of the decade. Maroon 5, from the get-go, was not gonna follow this up. A setlist would seemingly and smartly contain their most notable hits. It did not. The guests, Travis Scott and Big Boy, offered an interesting change of energy, but I don't think they offered any novelty, because I feel they were merely trendy choices. By default, the show is carried by Adam Levine, for better or for worse. The show was merely a Maroon 5 concert, with a confusing set list, out-of-place guest performers that, however, arguably added a nice change, and then Adam Levine took his shirt off. Don't get me wrong. Um, about that. It was a nice sight, but people complained about the shirtless body being shown on TV when apparently, according to some, the NFL allowed Janet Jackson to show her breasts. We know this is not the case. The complaints are ridiculous. People wanted Adam Levine banned, stating it was a double standard that his nipples were allowed to be aired on television. I in part discussed more in depth the issue surrounding Janet Jackson at the Super Bowl and how she was left scathed while Justin Timberlake was not. So if you're interested in that, go check it out in the description. So where did Maroon 5 go wrong? Their constant evolution with their music stylings have offered a lot of inconsistency, regularly becoming players into the current trends that offer a lot of unsustainability. Their frontman, Adam Levine, while talented, has been embroiled in a host of controversies, and with an egotistical perception against him, any dislike towards him ends up hurting the success of the other members. Not only that, but Maroon 5 has become about Adam Levine, as opposed to the band. Their Super Bowl performance revealed a lot of mediocrity and how much Maroon 5 has fallen from a lot of the things they've been praised about. 
interesting songwriting and subject matter, a more mass appeal, generally suited for broader audiences, and a more unified band that more aptly incorporated all members. Is all this to say Maroon 5 is a terrible band, shouldn't be listened to, or has no talent? Absolutely not. It's just interesting to see this arc in their career, and how much they've changed, and what factors build up to giving them their lowest peaking album to date. But let me know, what are your thoughts? Thank you so much for watching everybody. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to drop a like and subscribe so you can get more future content on all your favorite pop stars. If you'd like to help decide future video topics, get special comment and name badges, and get a shout out, then I'd love to have you as a channel member. Thank you for watching.